Coming up, we'll chat with the Pulitzer Prize winning composer from the Navajo Nation. And the creative behind the Bee Yellowtail Collective tells us about her fashions. Plus, Cheyenne and Arapaho Television turns 10. It's Oklahoma's only station owned by a tribe. I'm Malia Chavez. That's all coming up next on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Amirawa thank you for joining us. Winning a Pulitzer Prize puts you in an elite club, and for Raven Chacon, winning a Pulitzer put him in an even more exclusive club. Chacon is the first Native person to receive a Pulitzer Prize for musical composition. He wrote Voiceless Mass, which premiered last November in Wisconsin. The work was mesmerizing and evoked the weight of history in a church setting. It was a concentrated and powerful musical expression with a haunting visceral impact. That's how the Pulitzer panel described his music. Yes, this composition was commissioned last year by a music organization in Milwaukee called Present Music and was in collaboration with the United Church of Christ. And it was to utilize a massive pipe organ in the St. John the Evangelist Cathedral in Milwaukee. And so I wanted to write a piece, not only you know, in having this opportunity to write for this massive instrument, but thinking about the building that it is stewarded in the church. And thinking about the church as a site of, you know, gathering and uh, and prayer, but also this contradiction that the space itself allows for voices to be heard, choirs can sing in it, but sometimes, uh, you know, it it does not offer the space for people to express their voicings. And this is not limited to the church. This is something we see in universities and the academy and elsewhere. And so it considers that. Uh, you know, this futility of, of trying to give voice to the voiceless instead of offering space. Were you at all nervous to compose a piece like this, given that, as you said, Indigenous people haven't always been welcomed into spaces like the church? Not at all. Uh, you know, any opportunity I can have to speak to you know, current events or the situation of indigenous people today, I, I take that, you know, and if that can be done with artwork or music, then that becomes a bit of a challenge because music, you know, sometimes doesn't have words, especially in this case, this was not a piece that had uh, lyrics or libretto or any kind of other, you know, programmatic notes to it. So to, to be able to speak to this urgency through music was was what I what I tried to do, you know, and I'm happy that it got acknowledged by Pulitzer. I want to go exactly to that. Earlier this week, the Pulitzer uh, board mentioned that you were the first Native person to win a Pulitzer in musical composition. Where were you when you found out that news and what was your reaction? I was in my studio and, um, you know, normally I turn off the phone if I'm recording or, or writing and the phone just kept going off the hook. You know, I had no idea that I received this this award, and I was getting texts by friends and family and saying I won, and uh, <laughs> I was completely taken by surprise. And eventually learned what what was going on. So uh, yeah, I, I'm completely honored and, and humbled by it all that that my music has has made it to that level. How do you think that you winning this award sets the groundwork for others who might be interested in applying for the Pulitzer or other kinds of awards like the Pulitzer? 
well, you just have to keep doing this for, you know, decades. That's what I did. And, uh, you know, I, I perform music for 10 years for audiences that only had five people in them. And that's, that's what you have to do. There's no, uh, you know, very few quick, uh, recognition, uh, uh, that's going to happen, you know, and, uh, it takes a lot of hard work and there's not a whole lot of us native folks that are making, you know, um, composition or, or composing music. Um, so hopefully there's more awareness of, of the need for music education in schools, art education in schools, uh, especially in our native communities where that's not always a priority. So that's, the, I think that's the first step. And then of course, you know, higher education to getting those skills is, is the next step after that. You, of course, teach uh, students at IAIA. What do you think this award means for those students? And what exactly are you teaching them right now? Yeah, um, you know, just being aware of the other artwork that's being made out there. And, you know, sometimes we're, we're skeptical of that thinking, oh, you know, we'd, why why learn about, you know, what's being made in the rest of the world? And, and But artwork is a really good entry to other world views, you know, thinking about what people are are uh, addressing in their work, let's say in Africa or Asia or a lot of these places. There's there's artists all over the world, and for indigenous artists to connect with them, you know, not necessarily the artists that are working in Europe and and the rest of the country, but thinking about all these all these other ways of seeing the world uh, as is very exciting right now for indigenous artists. And I that's one of the the main requirements is just to look at as much art as possible and listen to as much music as as you can. After winning the Pulitzer, Raven Chacon finished writing a book on 13 Indigenous women composers. From music to fashion, when we come back, Bethany Yellowtail shares her journey in the world of designer clothing. Some people may have recently discovered the fashions of Bethany Yellowtail, but she's been designing clothing for more than 10 years. Her line, the B Yellowtail Collective, is based in Los Angeles and was on display at the Res 2022 conference in May. ICT editor Jordan Bennett Begay caught up with her. Some days it still feels like I'm just getting started because there's so much to do and so much to accomplish, but um, to be where we are now, I sometimes I still can't even imagine, I can't even like, I'm, sho I sh I'm shocked some days still, you know, I'm like, I can't believe we're here, I can't believe we've done this. Like, I grew up in Wyala, Montana, the Mighty Few District on the Crow Reservation, we have a population of under 200 people. and. Um, you know, I come from a cattle ranching family and just like we're right way out in the sticks and I always dreamed of doing this and to be running a company of my dreams and working with people I love, um, being able to give back to my community and work with my community, it's nothing like it exists in fashion and I'm just grateful that I set out on the path and we're, we're doing it and I'll be doing it for the rest of my life. What's um, what do you get your inspiration from for your designs? Yeah, I get my inspiration from everywhere, honestly. Like just the world view of being a native woman. Sometimes it's fabric that reminds me of my kalas, my grandmas. I remember going into um, a dead stock fabric store one day, and I saw this beautiful like cotton fabric, vintage cotton fabric, and I immediately thought of my grandmothers. And I just started pulling fabric that reminded me of them, like their cotton dresses and. So some days it's that, sometimes it's a color, sometimes it's a cultural story or a design motif, but really it comes from you know my heart. I have to always be in like a really good way or be really thinking intentionally about what these designs are gonna be putting out into the world and who's gonna be wearing them. And they're my, uh, my extension of me, you know, my, my love, my, um, 
my hopes, my prayers for our people, and then for myself. So as an artist, you know, it's very, you have to put yourself out there, and I imagine it's very scary to be that vulnerable. I mean, how do you <laughs> deal with that? <laughs> Um, sometimes I cry, you know, it's really, it's really hard. Um, it's scary to take a leap of faith on yourself in general, and then when you're in a very public space, it's absolutely hard, um, especially when our, our own people are sometimes our biggest critics, and we only want, for me, I only want to be doing well by our people, and so I'm real, I get sensitive about it, but uh, my bigger picture, the bigger vision for um, my company and myself, I know um, I have a good heart and I have a really incredible support system, um, accountability system with, you know, some of the best organizations in Indian country like Illuminatives or Native Wellness Institute. I have mentors around me and people to help me um, keep moving forward and help me to really like think about the way I'm making an impact beyond fashion. And I think that's probably what's most unique about the Yellow Tail. It's not just a fashion company to make clothes, a fashion company to um, be on the runway. It's a fashion company that has bigger vision for our people. Well, and like you said in the panel earlier, one of the bigger visions is you know economic prosperity for our communities, and I think it's really interesting. Cause I know there's some people who love to get a good deal yeah. on some earrings or a necklace, but then there's the other side of it where an artist puts so much work and labor materials in it, and they still have to put food on the table. Yeah. Um, what do you, I mean, what do you tell folks who just, because I know I, I've gone to like flea markets and people are like, yes, but then they get, get discouraged by something that's out of their budget. Yeah. Well, I always think about it from first, like, um, from our community perspective. Like, we, I come from a community where there's people who are making things all the time. And of course, we want to address our people. Um, it's important that we, you know, represent in our own communities too. However, the bigger picture is how that impacts our direct families, right? Because Native entrepreneurs, when we invest in Native entrepreneurs, it means we're investing in Native families, which means we're investing in Native communities. And for me, when we started Be Yellowtail, um, or the collective particularly, we really had to help our artists um, understand how to price their work in a different manner than we're used to in our own communities, because there's not disposable income. And a lot of times we trade, which is a beautiful thing. We have our own form of commerce in our communities, but to sustain in our families and we have to participate in you know the capitalist system unfortunately like we have to feed our families we have to provide for our for our own families and so how do we do that in a way where um, it's viable it's sustainable for ourselves right so um, I really came from thankfully my corporate fashion background I really helped understand how to price goods appropriately so labor costs cost of materials so we really work with um, the artists that have come on our platform to help price based on like just the data the facts of like this is how much time this is how much labor this is your materials this is the formula for retail and so when we take the emotion out of it we take the like oh who can afford it or not like this is what it will take to to be like an appropriate price for your work and it's so it takes that kind of like um, emotional part of it and I kind of worry about who can buy it or not or if, if our family can buy it or not or our relatives in our community can buy it or not and because we deserve to be able to sustain our families and for me that was the biggest um, most important part of building that platform is helping entrepreneurs in my own communities first and growing that. And now I really, we've seen the way the collective has uh, impacted Indian country and helped price things and set the bar for other entrepreneurs, even if they don't sell through us, like to price their work appropriately and advocate for buying native made and paying what it's worth. Uh, thank you so much for taking time of your day to be here with us. Thank Appreciate you. it. When we come back, it's all about books and puzzles for kids and adults. Last May, the children of the Chippewa Cree tribe received more than 3,000 new and gently used children's books. ICT's Caitlin Onawa-Boysell tells us how they got there. 
It had taken months to pull everything together. Sarah Wecker is the director of Essential Eats Distributors, which is based in Missoula, Montana. It is a nonprofit that provides resources to indigenous led programs around the state. They help deliver food, bikes, and now books to tribal communities. Sarah was asked to be a part of a special project to deliver books to a bookmobile to Rocky Boy. She says to her, it's all about giving back. The premise of our organization is to share in the wealth of the community I live in and to help bridge some of those gaps. Our tribal lands in Montana are extremely rural, almost all of them in extremely remote. Even with it being in a rural area, that didn't stop donors from filling up the shelves with quality books that were written specifically for Indigenous students. Wecker says an anonymous donor donated books made in Canada, and they weren't cheap. Some of the books that you sent had actual, you know, Cree language in it. Can you talk a little bit about that? And at first I was like, wow, this little box of books was $500. And here we're, we sent, you know, like, you know, two pallets full of books. And then I looked through them and they were so beautiful and so filled with incredible art. The bookmobile will be driving to different areas this summer around Rocky Boy. Their goal is eventually to have a librarian on staff and for the bookmobile to serve as a food truck for community events. Uh, I think it's a good stepping stone. In Springfield, Illinois, Caitlin Onawa Boycell, ICT News. Monica Nabumsa is taking puzzle making to a new level. About four years ago, she started making puzzles from intricate Hopi designs. It was a way for her to honor her late grandmother and pay tribute to a pastime they loved and shared, putting together a jigsaw puzzle. As ICT's Patty Tholohongo reports, Nabumsa paints each design, then turns it into one small but challenging puzzle. So this one here is called Ancestry. It represents all of my tribes, Hopi, Akuma, and Havasupai. And the design represents where I draw my strengths. Monica Nivamsa grew up on the Hopi Reservation in Arizona. She has fond memories of putting together puzzles with her so'o, her grandmother. It was a really, really nice memory and I decided to make a puzzle series um, not long after my grandmother passed away. It was my way of keeping her close. Monica turned her paintings into these unique puzzles, like this one that shows frogs singing on a lily pad. But we do have riparian areas and I've seen those places on Hopi and those are places that represent what we pray for in, in the rain. At a recent art market in Phoenix, this young boy diligently worked on a puzzle. They're only about seven inches in diameter. Uh, his sister was standing here next to him saying he loves puzzles. He's always fixing puzzles at home and he's standing there and he looks at me and says, this is a real challenge. <laughs> this is not her main job. Nuvamsa is the executive director of the Hopi Foundation, a nonprofit with a budget of $1.2 million. She oversees several programs, including Hopi radio station, KUYI. How's your business going? It's, it's still a hobby. <laughs> so far, she's made enough to cover expenses. And she's not in a rush. Like that young boy, she's diligently working to get her puzzles into gift shops that have ties to ancestral sites. In Phoenix, Patty Tholohungva, ICT News. When we come back, Oklahoma's only TV station owned by a tribe turns 10. We'll take you to CATV. In July of 2012, Cheyenne and Arapahoe Television started broadcasting. It's known as CATV, and viewers have come to enjoy shows with names like Indian Road, Making Regalia, and Fry Bread Flats. Senior content producer Darren Brown tells us how the station started and how it's grown. Well, uh, I will tell you that uh, 
a lot of it started before I got here. And I think uh, probably about six or seven years before they even got the grant, the, the tribe applied and received the grant in uh, somewhere around 2009 or 10. It was a $750,000 grant from an, an office of the FCC, which is no, no longer even there. So it was the, the last grant that they uh, put out from that office. It was uh, for a low power television station and educational station. And um, we went on the air in July of 2012, but there was much, much planning before we got here. And uh, we've been here 10 years and uh, I don't feel, I barely, I sort of feel like we barely started. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe talk about um, how rare it is to own and operate a tribally owned television station. Are there a lot of others around the country? Well, since we've been uh, in existence, we've we've uh, probably talked with about seven or eight other tribal television operations, but there are uh, some that we haven't. And I, there can't be, I'm thinking there probably can't be more than 10 or 15 in the entire country. Uh, there are, we are the only tribally owned and operated TV station in the state of Oklahoma. We're very small, but uh, there are 39 federally, arised, federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma, and most of them are doing media of some form. Uh, maybe some are doing feature films, uh, many are doing uh, streaming, but right now we are the only broadcast uh, put out by, uh, by a tribe. What kinds of content do you produce um, that viewers see on your television station? Well, we are uh, under the Ed Department of Education, but what we do is uh, we cover a lot of tribal events like powwows and uh, ground breakings and ribbon cuttings. And that's exciting because that means progress. Uh, whenever the tribe wins awards, we do things like that. We've done uh, a short, uh, an hour long documentary. And uh, we have, we produced a kid's show called Fry Bread Flats. Uh, a few years back, and we are currently working on a second season of that. Uh, we have a 30-minute show called Indian Road, which is kind of like a uh, just cool stuff that natives around this state are doing. And we are in developing a uh, live uh, Zoom-based interview show. So we've we've got a lot of a lot of irons in the fire right now. Maybe talk about the pandemic and sort of how you had to work around, you know, not being able to see each other in person and, you know, still produce content. Well, uh, there, there, there were furloughs. And, uh, you know, our newspaper was here doing the good work. Like I know a lot of tribal media companies around the state were. Uh, there were truthfully, there was very little we could do during the pandemic because at that point, we uh, we just didn't have the means, the resources to work uh, from home in a in a really effective way. Uh, since that, since then, we've bought equipment, we've bought laptops. So we have since the the major part of that pandemic, we have had to go home and work from home again. And things have been better. But I will tell you that caught us off guard, like I think it did a lot of tribes. And uh, uh, we're still taking precautions here. But I really hope that. We don't have to deal with that again. Darren, in Oklahoma and really across the country, I think you're a mentor and a friend to so many of us younger journalists. Maybe talk about, um, you know, how important it is to have a tribally owned TV station and what kinds of young people you see coming through there and, you know, how you hope to, to grow the next generation. Well, uh, right now, at least for another few days, we have an intern with us today. Um, he's been with us for a couple of weeks through the uh, summer youth program that the uh, tribe puts on. Uh, we've over the years, we've had half a dozen high school students in here. And I, I really thought that 10 years in that we would have some shine and rap of students graduating from college with degrees and in broadcast, uh, mass communications, whatever. And that hasn't happened. And I, I suppose I could find that discouraging. I just feel like uh, I haven't pushed it hard enough. <laughs> I do preach the native TV gospel every place I go. And you, you know yourself that I, I preach it at Naja all the time. And, uh, you know, there's a, there are numbers out there that show that the, the, the percentage of Native people working in television is about half of 1%, less than 1%. Now, I'm not kidding myself that we'll ever get to 20 or 30, but Aaliyah, there is, we should be able to get to 3 or 4 or 5%. And I'm not going to quit until we make that happen. Uh, I just think that if... If as Native people, if we are not there to advocate for our stories, then those stories don't get told. And if they don't get told, people don't understand and don't care. Not that they don't care, but they didn't know the story 
was there to be cared about. And when they do, things change. Darren, maybe talk about all of the fields that people can go into, into television. I mean, I have the job of being the anchor. I get to ask the questions. But of course, there's producers, there's people in the studio. Maybe talk about the many ways in which you can contribute to being an Indigenous person working in the television industry. Yeah, we get a lot of... Uh... I, I had the opportunity here, I'm very fortunate to get to speak to a lot of Native kids in high school and college and career days and stuff. And I don't think they all understand, that they understand there's, a, there's an anchor and reporter and a camera person. But I'm like, no, there are audio people, there are, there are engineers, there are salespeople. And if you ever watch the credits at the end of a film, there's lighting, there's electricians, there's makeup, there's music. and. Uh, uh, one of the other things that we run into is that people think that we make movies. Well, we don't, we do television, but I tell them, if you know how to shoot and light things properly and edit, those skills will translate to any hundreds and thousands of jobs. Uh, so the skill set is the same. Maybe the application is different. And, uh, you know, I, I find it exciting that things like res dogs uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the other, uh, movie, the other uh, show on Rutherford Falls. Falls. Thank you, Rutherford Falls. And stuff like that is happening. So it is an exciting time for, uh, for Native people. We're, we're being represented in more and more ways, uh, but there's still so much more work to be done. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can't. Oh, you got to run, you got to run.